Our last video from chapter 17, we're going to look at losing CO2 from a molecule and then putting all the reactions from chapter 17 together for some synthetic applications. Yep. So as I mentioned, let's look at losing CO2 first. Yep. Now, a carboxylic acid on its own is not going to spontaneously lose carbon dioxide, just like an alkane wouldn't spontaneously lose a proton, right? because what gets left behind, or what we can consider to be a leaving group, is a carbon that would have localized electrons, right? They would be stuck on just one of these two carbons, nowhere else to go. So if we're thinking about that like a leaving group, that would be an exceptionally strong base, right? So it just wouldn't happen. But the reason we mentioned that in what chapter 17 and 16 and 15 too have all been about is the presence of a carbonyl. Okay? Because the presence of a second carbonyl in the three position okay, can allow that to happen. Just like we can deprotonate an alpha hydrogen because those electrons can be delocalized, we can remove CO2 from an alpha carbon, which is kind of weird to think about it, why I said the three position before, right? Carbonyls in the one and the three position allows you to lose CO2 off of, you know, what's directly attached to the alpha carbon. And that loss of CO2 is known as a decarboxylation reaction, decarboxylation. And we see why that happens right here, okay? One of the lone pairs from the negatively charged oxygen kicks over, forms a pi bond, right? Can't have five bonds to this carbon. So this bond to our alpha carbon breaks right? and it can be delocalized onto our carbonyl. And that can happen just from heat. As long as you have a carbonyl in the one and three position, you can just heat it and lose CO2. But it's actually even easier under acidic conditions because it's aided by an intramolecular transfer reaction. Okay? And that produces an enol, but that enol immediately tautomerizes to the ketone. And we see what's going on here, right? We've got acidic conditions. We pick up the proton onto our oxygen here, right? That allows this lone pair of electrons, well, not lone pair, that bonded pair of electrons to kick down to form the pi bond. And this is the same arrow we saw before. Okay? Kind of all happening at once, directly forms an enol, but then that tautomerizes back to the ketone. The only other thing to look out for is a competing reaction. And just like we talked about esters being less reactive in the past, if your other carbonyl is a carboxylic acid, so you're starting with a dicarboxylic acid, right? See a carboxylic acid here and here, it's twisted around. You've got competition going on for this electron pair being able to move over to this bond as well as the lone pair electrons on oxygen that aren't shown here, but you know we're there, right? That are also right, contributing by resonance to that bond. So you've got some competition going on. So those do require more heat. Yeah. Only other thing to worry about, right? You could still do it, just requires more heat. So to summarize all of those slides, right, carboxylic acids with a carbonyl at the three position can lose CO2 when heated which is what we see here, right? Delta represents heat. Carbonyl at the three position, we can lose CO2 when they're heated. So now let's talk about some synthetic applications, starting with something that's known as the malonic ester synthesis, pardon me. Okay, the malonic ester synthesis, and then we're going to this acetoacetic acid synthesis after this. And these are two named reactions, Right, you can refer to the malonic ester synthesis, even though they're not named after people. Right, they're very common synthetic applications. The malonic ester synthesis is a really common way to make carboxylic acids. Yeah, because that's really what you would define the malonic ester synthesis as: a reaction to prepare carboxylic acids of any desired link, anything you want, by starting with malonic ester and then controlling this right here, right? Step two, the length of your alkyl halide. That'll allow you to control the length of the carboxylic acid that's produced, right? Because these two carbons come from malonic ester, but everything else is coming from your alkyl halide in step two. Okay, so that's how these things are used in industry for synthesis, for example.
So what does that reaction look like? Okay. Well, I'm using a base to deprotonate my alpha carbon, which is super easy to do, right? Because it's delocalized onto two carbonyls right there. And notice again, just like we said in the previous video, the base here is the same as the leaving group from my ester because there is gonna be a competing reaction where it attacks the carbonyl, but then the leaving group is the same. So that's not gonna affect my synthetic yield. So deprotonate the alpha carbon, produce my carbanion here. That reacts with my alkyl halide. It's an SN2 reaction. Okay, so it's best if this is methyl or primary. Then that forms right my alpha substituted malonic ester. Okay, I heat that in acidic solution to get my hydrolysis. Okay, this takes my esters into carboxylic acids. And then like we just talked about, now I've got a carbonyl three position. So I just heat it, I lose CO2, and I've got my carboxylic acid of the desired length. And I can actually add in another substituent in here, right, which would end up as another substituent on my carboxylic acid by doing the alkylation twice. So here I alkylate once, then I deprotonate again, alkylate a second time. So I can control the react or sorry, the substituents that end up on my final carboxylic acid. So it's the same exact reaction as what we just saw. You're just doing it twice. And that makes it easy to predict with retrosynthesis. Okay, I kind of alluded to this at the beginning, right? But the two carbons, the one that's on your carbonyl and the alpha carbon, those are coming from malonic ester, everything else coming from alkyl halides. So that's how it's easy to tailor the length of these carboxylic acids. A similar reaction, another synthesis, the acetoacetic ester synthesis, okay, which looks damn near the same the only difference is now we're making a methyl ketone instead of a carboxylic acid. Okay, so instead of having an OH right here, right, we've got a CH3 because we're starting with acetoacetic ester instead of malonic ester. But other than that, same, right? Use a base that's the same as the leaving group on your ester, control the length of your alkyl halide to control the length of the chain over here, hydrolyze at the end, or in business. So you take a look at that reaction and you'll see it's pretty much the same thing, just a different starting material. And you're finishing with a decarboxylation reaction. For both of these, this is advantageous, right? Because your final product only goes forward. You can drive that CO2 gas off and you don't have to worry about going all the way back to the reactants. And then I've already mentioned this as well, right? Those three carbons now, malonic ester, ester synthesis was two, acetoacetic ester synthesis is three. Just track where your carbons are coming from. Those three from acetoacetic ester, the length of your chain comes directly from your alkyl halide. So let's now consider those reactions in the context of their synthetic applications, okay? Designing a synthesis. Okay, well, if I'm trying to make a molecule on the right here, I figure out the bond that I need to form, do a disconnection reaction, come back here, figure that I could make it from a carboxylic acid and my ketone. And now from chapter 17, I, I know there's a variety of ways to do these things. But first, after I do my disconnection, do I think, all right, do I make this a nucleophile and an electrophile or an electrophile and a nucleophile, those synthons that we talked about before? Okay. And now we've done 15, 16, 17. You should realize that, of course, this has to be the electrophile, right? That carbonyl carbon is always electrophilic, and we can make the alpha carbon nucleophilic by deprotonating it, right? It would be exceptionally difficult to do this over here. We could make this carbon electrophilic by putting a strongly electron withdrawing substituent, but it would be impossible to make this carbon nucleophilic. So then what's my synthetic application? take my carboxylic acid, turn it into an ester so that I've got a better leaving group that can be eliminated, I can pull off the alpha hydrogen, attack my carbonyl, and then I'm in business. Okay. So lots of things to play around with. Here's another one, do a disconnection, right? figure out what bonds you can easily create. And we can do that by, in this situation, doing the malonic ester synthesis twice. Okay. So adding two substituents, just coming from the same molecule. 
Yeah, so just as a quick note, I am skipping the biochemistry that's covered in 17.21. You should uh, read that if you get a chance on your own time, right? It takes a lot of the reactions from chapter 17 and shows you the role in the human body, right? Things like gluconeogenesis and collagen, fatty acids, ketosis, and more. So, you know, that would be a good way to review these reactions, see how they happen in the body. Yeah, but this is an organic course, not a biochem course. So that brings us to the summary of group three. Yeah, chapter 15, 16, and 17, we're all about group three, focusing on the carbonyl, right? And at first glance at this chart, group three looks like the smallest, but we actually spent more time talking about this than we did group two. Yeah, because there's lots of different reactivity to consider, right? It's not anymore just a carboxylic acid derivative versus an aldehyde or a ketone. Right? We've got to consider things like deprotonation of the alpha carbon. Is it unsaturated, right? Alpha, beta, unsaturated. So could it do a conjugate addition? Lots of things to consider from those three chapters. Okay. To try and summarize it as succinctly as possible, everything in group three has a carbonyl group. Okay? So we have that electrophilic carbon on the carbonyl. It's going to react with a nucleophile. First thing we're asking is, can the attached group to that carbonyl be replaced, okay? Because like an acyl chloride, it can easily be replaced. So we do a nucleophilic acyl substitution versus things like aldehydes, right? Not so easy. So those tend to undergo nucleophilic addition reactions. Have to have a strongly basic nucleophile there. In chapter 16, we saw if the attacking atom is oxygen or nitrogen with those lone pairs, if I'm in an acidic solution, then I end up eliminating water, form things like an imine. And what we spent a lot of time on in this chapter, if I pull hydrogen off of the alpha carbon, I create an enolate. That enolate can act as a nucleophile and react with electrophiles, either other electrophiles in solution or even itself in an intramolecular reaction. So that's not all of it, just the big ideas. Plenty of things to consider from chapter 15, 16, 17. And remember, as always, there are practice problems contained in the slides at the end of this chapter.